Modern Warfare is considered one of the greatest FPS shooter campaigns of all time. To top it is, to put it simply, a tough task. Did its sequel, Modern Warfare 2, manage to do it? Well, it depends on who you ask. For some, Modern Warfare 2 is a bigger and better game, taking all the elements of Modern Warfare and cranking them up to 11. For others, Modern Warfare 2 represents jumping the shark, the Michael Bayification of a series that once felt grounded, turning it into something so high octane that it loses impact. Where do I stand? Well, I won't try to hide the ball. Modern Warfare 2 is my favorite campaign in the Call of Duty series. In fact, it might be my favorite first person shooter campaign of all time. It's neck and neck with a few other titles for sure. And my favorite really depends on what day you ask me. However, with that said, I nonetheless have more conflicted feelings about this game than I do its predecessor. Modern Warfare 2 in isolation is just about perfect to me. Isolation, however, is a key word. My favorite part of stories in general is the conclusion. If I had to pick, I would pick the third book in a trilogy. The story is at its most intense, everything is culminating, and the stakes are the highest. I think I love Modern Warfare 2 so much because it feels like a conclusion. The pacing is so high octane, with the gas pedal all the way to the floor throughout. The stakes too are incredibly high, and it feels like the entire world is falling apart. Modern Warfare 2 is a masterclass in capturing visceral emotion, and I want to delve into the craftsmanship of the game. Above all, I guess, I want to show why I love this campaign so much. But I think Modern Warfare 2's intensity, while great on its own, makes a follow-up game incredibly hard to make. At the end, I'll reflect on that. With all that said, let's dive into Modern Warfare 2. Modern Warfare 2 opens with vignettes from the first game, which quickly summarize the story. These clips are paired with powerful music that does a great job of firmly placing us back in this world and its characters. The introduction ends with three words, ominously laid against a black backdrop. Five years later. Next, we hear from General Shepard. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Boundaries shift, new players step in, but power always finds a place to rest its head. We fought and bled alongside the Russians. We should have known they'd hate us for it. History is written by the victor, and here I am thinking we'd won. But you bring down one enemy and they find someone even worse to replace him. Locations change, the rationale, the objective. Yesterday's enemies are today's recruits. Train them to fight alongside you and pray they don't eventually decide to hate you for it too. Despite the five-year time gap, it's evident that fallout from the first game's events are still being felt, another thing that the opening vignettes establish visually. Public opinion on Zakayev has changed in Russia. The fringe ultranationalist is viewed as a hero now, and given his hostility and aggression, that doesn't bode well for the world stage. What I like even more about this cutscene, though, is that it's a great introduction to General Shepard. It reveals a cynical outlook on life, politics, and people. Loyalty is not an ideal that General Shepard values. Allies are only bound to each other by their shared interests, not any sense of loyalty. As soon as an ally's interests diverge, they will become your enemies. People are tools to be used for your own interests and held at a distance, for they will surely betray you if given enough time and reason. The world too never really gets better or worse. Power simply moves from head to head. History always rewritten by the victor. Shepard's cynical outlook is already foreshadowing events near the end of the game. Attention switches from Russia to a ranger base in Afghanistan. Shepard tells Sergeant Foley that he's looking for something, but we as the audience aren't privy to what that thing is quite yet. The player steps into the shoes of Private First Class Joseph Allen. He gives a quick weapons demonstration and runs through a training course. Like the first game, Modern Warfare 2 will recommend a difficulty based on your performance, which is a detail I've always liked. Unlike the first game, I didn't botch my first attempt and got recommended Harden. Allen deploys on a mission. During the journey over, we hear another speech by Shepard. On the surface, it's your standard patriotic stuff about America being the most powerful military force. However, what's interesting is that it reinforces the same character traits in Shepard that were present in the introduction. It's evident here 
that despite Shepard's lip service to freedom, he still boils conflict down to power struggles. His words at the end, though, are the most revealing and the most unsettling on subsequent playthroughs. This is a time for heroes, a time for legends. History is written by the victors. Let's get to work. He states that it's a time for heroes and legends. Furthermore, he reiterates that history is written by the victors. Let's put it all together. Shepard doesn't value loyalty. The world is a sea of conflict, and he doesn't seem to put much moral value in anything aside from power. Winners get to write history, and history is a time of heroes and legends, a time for stories. It's implied that Shepard will do whatever it takes to win, and that once he's the victor, none of the atrocities beforehand matter, because he can write history to be whatever he wants it to be. He can make himself a hero even. This is a noxious combination of beliefs, and it's indicative that Shepard is prepared to do truly terrible things. Alan is deployed into combat, beginning the first proper mission in the game. The bridge combat team is trapped across the river. Alan and the other rangers need to fight back Op 4, the enemy faction, and take back the town they occupy. The most interesting part of this first mission for me is the distinct lack of context given for it. When playing this time around, I came to the realization that I never really knew what was going on during this mission. Even the details I just mentioned are scraped up by passing dialogue. I bet I'm not alone in that the details pass me by. Generally, you know who you're fighting, why you're fighting, and all that. Here, even the enemy is vague. Op 4 literally is short for opposing faction. However, I think this vagueness is deliberate. We're fighting under General Shepard, and this is a manifestation of his leadership style. General Shepard boils conflict down to power struggles, so that's all this mission really is to the soldiers on the ground too. A power struggle between us and our enemy. The rest of the context doesn't really matter. Furthermore, Shepard sees his men as tools, waiting to betray him. Of course he's going to operate things on a need-to-know basis. Why does Alan or any of the foot soldiers need to know anything more than who to point their rifles at? So I think this mission uses show don't tell in a really powerful and novel way here. After Op 4 is cleared out, Alan reports to General Shepard. The general is pleased with his performance. Alan is reassigned to Task Force 141, where he will now report directly to Shepard. Alan is honored, and he's excited to meet the rest of the team. That will have to wait though. 141 is currently recovering a downed ACS module behind enemy lines. The player takes the shoes of Gary Roach Sanderson, working under Captain Soap McTavish. Soap is a welcome sight for returning players. At the end of the first game, he is injured, and it wasn't clear whether he would survive or not. Captain Price 2 is injured. He is nowhere to be found though. In his absence, Soap has assumed the rank of captain. It's a nice development for him. Roach and McTavis sneak behind enemy lines, taking out hostile soldiers with the help of silencers and heartbeat sensors. This stealth mission, set in this cold, stark environment, feels like the perfect introduction to Task Force 141. They are cold and lethal, just like the snowy wilderness. There are also some fun callbacks to the first game. Roach, these muppets have no idea where he is. This is a callback to my favorite line. Right. What the hell kind of name is Soap, eh? How a Muppet like you pass selection? Eventually, Roach and Captain McTavish are compromised, so they go guns loud. The mission becomes an explosive getaway sequence as the 141 operators fight through an army of opposition and board getaway snowmobiles. This segment for a lot of people is where Modern Warfare 2 jumps the shark. The first Modern Warfare wasn't realistic gameplay-wise, mind you, but there's a definite attempt to ground the story and atmosphere. That contrasts starkly with this section, we are unloading a Glock one-handed as you pilot a snowmobile down the side of a mountain. You couldn't imagine a segment like this being in the first game. With that said, I do think this mission works well for the story. Task Force 141 seems invincible here, and the tone does feel like an action movie. Two men manage to take down an entire base by their lonesome. They're successful in their mission too, recovering the module. This all contrasts greatly with the next mission, and it makes this next mission's strategy and horrors even more punchy. This mission is the most known in Modern Warfare 2, and it's one of the most infamous in video game history. That mission is no Russian. Perspective returns to Alan, Shepard orders him to go deep undercover with the CIA. He is to get close to a guy named Makarov, a brutal man who fights for no country but only his own interests, dealing in blood and torture. 
He has no boundaries to speak of, which we will witness very shortly. Shepard says that getting close to Makarov will cost Alan a piece of himself, but that it's nothing compared to what we'll save. As is becoming patterned with Shepard, the mission is vague. Why exactly does Alan have to get close to Makarov? What will Alan save? There are no answers. The mission begins with Makarov's chilling and iconic line. Remember, no Russian. The mission becomes frighteningly clear. Makarov is conducting a terrorist attack on the airport. We as Alan have to be part of it. Shepard was understating the cost. This mission will cost more to Alan than just one part of himself. It will cost his entire soul. Makarov's men make their way through the airport, mercilessly gunning down civilians. It's a ghastly sight. As Alan, you don't have to fire personally, but you have to carry on with these men and watch. I don't think I have to explain why this mission was incredibly controversial, even making it on national news for being so violent. I want to keep the focus of this video on the game itself, so I'm not really going to dive into the controversy. I'm sure there are countless videos just on No Russian if you want to learn more about it. For this video, I'm interested in if this mission is effective from a storytelling and narrative point of view. In terms of drawing emotion out of the player, this mission is certainly effective. To be honest, I don't enjoy playing it. It's just unsettling and gives me a slimy feeling, which is exactly what it's trying to do. The contrast between this mission and the rest of the game is part of what makes it so effective, but because of the contrast, it also feels out of place. Let's look at another one of my favorite games as an example, Spec Ops The Line. I have an entire video on that game if you're interested. I won't spoil story events, but a lot of horrific things happen. However, the difference is nearly the entire game has that tone, and it's focused on the horrors of war. A visceral, unsettling scene like this would mesh seamlessly with the rest of the game. Modern Warfare 2, in contrast, doesn't have the same grittiness or dedication to depicting the brutality of violence. As a result, no Russian burns itself into your brain. The suffering of the civilians is rendered with such attention to detail. People literally are dragging their fallen friends and family. They limp away with wounds and so on. If you ask most players about the campaign of Modern Warfare 2, I'd wager that the first thing most will bring up is No Russian. This mission almost overshadows the rest of the game because of how jarring the tonal shift is, and I'm not sure that's a great thing. Even the developers knew it was a departure from the rest of the game, evidenced by the fact that you are giving a warning about this mission when you start the campaign, and you can just outright skip it. I could go on analyzing whether or not No Russian is too jarring of a tonal shift for the game, but at that point, No Russian would be overshadowing the rest of this video, which would be a bit ironic, and I don't want that. So, No Russian punches hard emotionally. What else does it accomplish narratively? This mission does a great job of establishing Makarov as a villain. This mission instills a very strong hatred of him, as you watch him mow down civilians with abandon. Shepard's description of him as a man that has no boundaries is accurate. He has no sense of hesitation or any signs of remorse for his actions either. Yet at the same time, he's not depicted as an unhinged maniac either. They're right on time. Check your weapons and ammo. We've waited a long time for this. <laughs> Haven't we all? His actions are calculated, blisteringly so. You see hints of this in the beginning, when he stresses the importance of his men not speaking Russian. But you see it even more at the mission's conclusion. We've sent a strong message with this attack, knock it off. This is a message. The Americans thought he could deceive us. When they find out by, all of Russia will cry for war. This massacre wasn't just an indiscriminate act of terror. Makarov executed the attack knowing that Allen was an American mole. If Allen's body was found, the Russians would blame America. The beginning cutscene established that ultranationalists have gained power in the country. It's a powder keg, just waiting for ignition. Alan is the spark to ignite the world ablaze. Alan's death is also the final gut punch of tragedy, and it makes this mission even more resonant. You can't help but mourn for him. This guy is a patriot who just wanted to serve his country, so much so that he's willing to delve into the darkest depths and be part of a sickening tragedy that will scar his soul beyond repair. And for all that sacrifice, his mission ends in failure. Catastrophic failure. His death precipitates chaos that will amass even more death than this airport attack. 
There's just an irony and sadness to that which I find really powerful. By the end of this mission, you hate Makarov and you want to get him. In that way, the player's motivation syncs up really well with Task Force 141's goals. Although Makarov probably gets as much screen time as Zakayev got in the first Modern Warfare, I had a lot more feeling towards Makarov than Zakayev. And that's a sign to me that Modern Warfare 2 did a great job setting up its villain. Despite Shepard's miscalculation, he and his team continue moving forward. To prevent war, they need proof that Makarov was the one behind the op, not the US forces. They track down Alejandro Rojas, or Alex the Red, in Brazil by analyzing the bullet casings from the attack. He is the one who supplied Makarov. Task Force 141 heads out to get him. They find his right-hand man, who catches wind of their attack. After a brief little chase, they capture him, and Soap and Ghost promptly begin interrogation on him. Modern Warfare 2 is delving into more morally gray territory than the first game. In the first game, Price did interrogate Al-Assad, but it wasn't quite to the same level as rigging him with shock collars. This is paired with Alan's deep op, which was very clearly morally gray at the minimum. This moral grayness continues throughout the level. As Roach and his allies hunt through the favelas, panicked civilians dart into your view, and it takes a disciplined trigger finger to not shoot them. It creates a sense of unease, a sense of hesitation whenever you're about to pull the trigger, which emphasizes the general lack of clarity we feel. This is emphasized further by the level design. Enemies shoot at you from nearly every direction, high and low, and it's disorienting. Eventually, 141 catches up to the arms dealer and Soap captures him. Things finally are looking up. Then the next mission begins. An ominous cutscene plays between NORAD and an Air Force base. They're getting phantom sightings on the west coast, unsure if there really are enemy soldiers or not. They don't learn, until it's too late, that the Russians are actually attacking from the east. The ACS module that 141 retrieved during Cliffhanger, well, it looks like the Russians still managed to crack it, and this let them bypass the US's defensive grid undetected. Now the US is scrambling to defend herself as an invasion begins in full force. Here begins the mission Wolverines. The player assumes control of Private James Ramirez under the command of Sergeant Foley. The mission begins with Ramirez traveling through a sleepy American suburb. The sky though is gray and glowing, signaling a world that is about to burst into flames. A swarm of paratroopers blot the sky, along with their planes flying overhead. When Ramirez steps out on foot, the paratroopers only seem to increase. Surface-to-air fire explodes in the sky. Ramirez is joined by only a handful of other rangers. They run in front of you, framing their small numbers against the paratroopers. Through this imagery, the game communicates the situation very clearly. You're unprepared and outnumbered. The beautiful score swells in the background, complementing this imagery perfectly. I'm going into such detail about this because I think that Wolverine sets his melancholy, desperate mood perfectly. Already there's a despair that's just palpable. The mood being created here is why this mission, the subsequent Ranger missions, are my favorites out of pretty much all first person shooters. The Rangers fight through Russian forces, ending up in a small center with fast food restaurants and gas stations. They have to defend these objectives against incoming enemies. These in-game objectives are apt. Fighting a defensive battle and trying to hold your ground against the incoming horde helps sell the larger state of the conflict. The fact that the Rangers are fighting to defend gas stations and restaurants too underscores just how unprepared they were for this fight. Although the setting is pedestrian, there's a high value target here, codenamed Raptor, and the Rangers retrieve him from a fallen helicopter. The Rangers are successful in their mission, but as they head to vehicles for exfil, an even larger force of paratroopers fall from the sky. Past them, the sky is burning even more intensely than before. The desperation becomes even more intense. Perspective returns to Task Force 141. All they got out of the arms dealer is that Makarov hates someone even more than the Americans, and this guy is locked up in a gulag in Russia. This is the only lead 141 has. They hope to use this prisoner as bait to lure Makarov into the open. There's bad news though. The local militia is closing in on them, and they have to escape. Nikolai readies the chopper for them. Nikolai was a Russian informant in the first game, so it's cool seeing him return in the second game to help Soap once more. Nikolai is pushed further and further out by the militia. It comes down to a desperate chase, with Roach having to die for the helicopter. They barely make it out. Perspective switches back to our rangers in the US. Shepard commandeers Sergeant Foley's unit and gives them a new assignment. 
The Russians are burning through their defenses and intel, and while the Rangers are going to stop them, they deploy with the Honey Badger to take out enemy anti-air systems. The Rangers fight inch by inch through suburbia, now inundated with bullet fire and explosions. The enemy opposition is intense, which feels even more intense due to the close quarters nature of fighting. This sky is even more yellow and red than the prior Ranger mission. The fires once at the horizon seem to be consuming the entire sky now. The use of color here does a good job of highlighting the overall conflict. The world is on fire, and that flame is only growing. The atmosphere here is amazing too, almost verging on the post-apocalyptic. Enemy choppers overwhelm the sky. A burning plane too leaves a trail of smoke as it plummets to the earth. We'll see this plane again in a moment. Yet at the same time, the player feels more powerful here. You have the power of the honey badger at your disposal. With the click of a button, you can laze targets, which the honey badger will take out with prejudice. The enemy's power is growing, but so is yours. The increase on both sides meshes well with the rising action stage of the plot. Foley's unit takes out the triple A's, freeing the skies, but they don't get the chance to rest. Shepard gives them a new mission. They're to retrieve a high value target from a panic room. They approach the house. The plane we saw before had crashed in front of it. I like this detail, and it's something I hadn't noticed before. Unfortunately, when they get to the panic room, they find the HVT already dead. Fully reports back to Shepard. With that, we leave the Rangers for now and return to Task Force 141. They want to get to the mystery man in the gulag that Makarov hates, but they can't do it quite yet. The Russians have set up SAM air defenses on oil rigs. Oil workers are being used as human shields, so these rigs can't be blown up outright. Task Force 141 is to clear out the rig to create a pathway to reach the Gulag. I will say, given Shepard's willingness to sacrifice civilians for the CIA op, not to mention his later actions in the game, his reluctance to kill civilians initially struck me as a bit contrived. But after giving it some more thought, I actually think it makes sense. Shepard cares about being perceived as a hero, so even if he doesn't personally care about saving the civilians, I think he cares about wanting to look like the guy who does, if that makes sense. 141 infiltrates the rig in a cool segment before sneaking about the rig and freeing civilians. I do love the color palette of this mission. The blues and whites are a great visual break from the apocalyptic yellows and reds. Modern Warfare 2 has a great visual pacing and it swaps between color schemes right when one setting starts feeling a bit samey. It gives the game a visual punch that still holds up today. The slower, more deliberate gameplay of this mission, at least at the beginning, is also a welcome reprieve from the intense fighting during the Ranger missions. Even when the action ramps up, this mission has fresh ideas like having to fight through a smoke screen with the aid of thermal optics. Overall, while the pacing of Modern Warfare 2 is certainly faster than the first game, I still do think there is attention paid to making the game feel varied and dynamic. Once the oil rig is cleared, 141 is clear to set off to the Gulag. During the debrief, Captain McTavish gives a short history of the building. It started out as a castle with an actual dungeon, built to withstand any siege. The building survived every brutal winter. The occupants, they weren't so lucky. The monastery didn't survive the purges. Over the last century, it has played host to anyone the government didn't want but couldn't kill. The place is filled with living casualties of the last war, which I swear I thought we'd won. And I suppose it's all a day at the races. You back the losing horse and this is where you end up. 67's the piece to meet Makarov once, so let's cut him loose. This debrief is great. It sets the setting really well and it gets the player amped up to storm the place. Call of Duty games in general don't usually have a ton of setting building since the locations are based on real life most of the time, so this aspect is cool to see. The Gulag mission begins and it's great. I was going to say it was one of my favorites in the game, but I find myself wanting to say that about like half the missions in the game. It goes to show why it's top tier for me. The Gulag is an incredibly varied mission. You start off providing sniper overwatch from a helicopter before storming the exterior. From there, 141 descends into the prison. There's a cool segment in the center of the Panopticon where you use a riot shield and brace against an onslaught of foes. This is followed by a night vision segment where you skulk through shadows like a predator. Then there's an intense opposition in the shower where 141 has to fight tooth and nail through riot shield guards while their buddies shoot at you from above. You have to watch all angles and be very strategic. All this is to say there's an incredible variety to the Gulag and it's an edge of your seat roller coaster in the best way. 
It really showcases the highs that a cinematic campaign can reach. This is all punctuated by the big reveal at the end. The prisoner you're after is none other than Captain Price himself, our fearless leader from the prior game. He is the primary man responsible for taking down ultranationalists like Zakayev and his allies like Al-Assad. It's not difficult to see why Makarov hates him so much. They need to get out of the gulag and fast. The building's coming down around them. A frenetic sequence ensues, where 141 tries to get to an escape chopper. They're finally pulled up through a route created by a dropped bomb, which ended up being a dud. The mission comes to an explosive end, with the gulag going up in flames behind them. Any excitement is dulled quickly by the start of the next mission. The debrief is just an emergency broadcast message, which drones with an unsettling alarm. I find this really eerie, and it sends a chill up my spine. Maybe that's because I've heard broadcasts like this in real life for tornado warnings, but it definitely had an impact on me either way. It sets the stage perfectly for the mission. The player takes the shoes of Ramirez once more. He's in an underground evac center, one appearing in disarray and hastily put together. Rangers are wounded, and they're just littered about. There isn't anyone to help him, it seems. Explosions roar from above and each rumble shakes the center. From all this, it's clear that the rangers are not in great shape, and this dour mood is punctuated perfectly by the mournful soundtrack. A mood of desperation and despair are perfectly set. Despite being down, the rangers aren't out. They head to the surface to buy time for the evac effort. The Hoover building awaits. The imagery here is powerful. Once more, the sky is even more intense than before, now actually glowing like a fire. And there's just something too about weaving through bunkers, slipping past razor wires, with your enemy shooting down on you from atop one of your own nation's cherished buildings. I guess it just really underscores the dire state of this fight. You were caught unprepared for the battle. Now you have to do everything you can to take back what was stolen from you. They fight through opposition in the building. The close quarters nature of the fighting is intense, but it also makes the fighting feel more personal. The rangers reach the enemy's crow's nest, where the player gets a good view of the battle. I know I've been going on and on about the visuals in the sky, but the wrecked monument here, getting rocketed by enemy ordnance, with a bloody sky and the cratered earth is great visually. Call of Duty games have gotten the rap of being overly grain brown, but I really do think Modern Warfare 2 uses color masterfully. Ramirez assists the best he can by sniping enemies and taking down helicopters. Having bought the evac site time, they race to the rooftop, as they're in danger of being overrun. An intense race against the clock follows. They board a helicopter with Ramirez taking the minigun. Ramirez deals damage to the enemy, causing a bunch of explosions. There's a sense of triumph as it feels like the tide is finally turning against the enemy, but this feeling is fleeting. Their chopper is hit by a rocket and it crash lands. Ramirez comes too. His fellow rangers are desperately holding out against encroaching enemies. They're low on ammo. Ramirez only has one magazine left, but the enemies are endless. Things aren't looking good. The mission abruptly ends on this note that seems utterly hopeless. It's a great cliffhanger. Speaking of cliffhangers, I'm going to take a very brief pause to plug my science fiction series in the Northfield Saga. If you like high intensity action and high emotional stakes, please consider checking out my series. I think you'll really enjoy it. The third book in the series actually just took first place in another book festival, winning the Best General Fiction Award in the Southwest Book Festival. That makes it the second book festival win after the New England Book Festival in December last year. It also got an honorable mention in the same category in the Northwest Book Festival. So if you're interested, I hope that's a good testament to the quality I think it has. A link is in the description. I appreciate the support from everyone. Perspective return to Task Force 141. Shepard gives Price a debrief on the situation. Very quickly, the men butt heads on what to do next. Price wants to end the war with a brutal, decisive action, while Shepard thinks the focus should be on finding Makarov. The Rangers' struggle is great for contextualizing Task Force 141's mission. Having experienced the war firsthand, you know very well the stakes if 141 fails. It gives you a bigger investment in their mission than you would otherwise have, and you feel the sense of urgency. 
Because of the state that the Rangers are in, I think the player is naturally inclined to side with Price here. Given where we left off with Ramirez, you understand the damage if this war continues on any longer. The men can't come to an agreement, so Price takes matters into his own hands and disobeys Shepard. You've been in the gulag too long, Price. Focus on taking out Makarov. No time, sir. We need to end this war today. I'm not asking you, Price. This is an order. You're the... Looks like we lost our connection. He is the only one so far who has given Shepard any questioning or pushback. He's always had a good read on people and that shows here. They sneak through the snowy forest on their way to the nuclear sub. Once more, the slower and more deliberate mission is a great break from the war state side. Pretty soon their cover is blown and they fight tooth and nail through hordes of troops. They are aided by the Predator missile, which adds a nice change up to gameplay and tips the odds back in our favor. They reach the sub. Ghost panics because the nuclear silo doors open. This is what Price wanted though. He wanted to launch the nuke. Shepard appears vindicated. Captain Price really does seem off his rocker. Shepard discusses the rocket's travel path with the Secretary of Defense. The rockets seem poised to hit the East Coast, and tens of thousands of casualties are expected. On that pleasant note, Perspective once again switches back to Ramirez, who's still stuck in the helicopter. The moment's replay of him fighting with his last magazine against endless enemy forces all seems truly lost now. But then, Perspective is pulled all the way back into orbit. From the perspective of an astronaut on the International Space Station, we see Price's warhead curve around the Earth's surface. Then, detonation. The poor astronaut comes crashing down to the Earth with the station destroyed. Here at the darkest moment, Price's intention finally comes into light. The nuke being detonated in the atmosphere triggers an electromagnetic pulse, EMP for short which destroys all electronics. This may seem far-fetched, but it's actually scientifically accurate. This EMP discombobulates the Russians, sending their aircraft crashing down. The Rangers don't know what's going on, but they do know to run. The EMP buys the Rangers enough time to escape narrowly, barely avoiding the plummeting aircraft. Once they regroup, they venture out into the darkness. Their comms are down, so they have no way to communicate. Even their weapon optics are disabled. This mission feels truly post-apocalyptic as the rangers make their way through the wreckage, cut off from command, with everything being eerily silent. They come across a ranger who's serving as a runner to deliver messages, although he's too disoriented to even remember the passcode. Star! Oh, we will fire on you! I don't remember the damn countersign, all right? I'm just a runner. Don't shoot! The proper response is Texas, soldier. What do you got? Colonel Marshall's assembling a task force at Whiskey Hotel. You guys need to keep heading north. So where are you going then? Tell everyone else. The runner tells them to meet at Whiskey Hotel. Soon the rangers run into opposition. The Russians are in smaller packs now, and they're not the organized onslaught that they were earlier, as they're similarly cut off from command. Price's goal of disrupting and thereby slowing down the war seems to have been a success. It's cool to see 141's actions directly impact the rangers on the ground, as it once again adds a further gravity to their mission. A rainstorm starts, which adds to the dour mood, the darkness, and the sense of chaos and disorientation. Thunder and lightning rain in the dark sky. This and the following mission, which is really just one big two-parter, has my favorite atmosphere in the game. With how much I've gone on about the atmosphere, it's saying something. They reach Whiskey Hotel, and so begins a desperate fight for the White House. This mission evokes similar feelings as taking the Hoover Building, with us fighting to take back a building of even greater importance. Bunny hopping between craters as enemies fire mercilessly from above. The darkness and the rain create an even more somber and oppressive atmosphere than last time. The Rangers manage to take back the White House, and they deploy signal flares to alert US jets that they're friendly. Signal flares also emanate from nearby rooftops, signifying that the US forces are making progress in taking back the capital. I think that the end of this mission is an overall declaration that Price's Gambit was a success. 
but the halt of the Russian advance long enough for the US to rally. With this victory, Shepard sets his sights back on capturing Makarov, if his sights ever left Makarov. He's always been pretty fixated on Makarov, now hasn't he? His right history line also reinforces what I was talking about earlier. Shepard is a firm believer in history being written by the victor, so being the victor is all that matters. There are two potential safe havens that Makarov could be at. The first is a boneyard in the Caucasus Mountains, and the second is an estate in Afghanistan. One for one breaks up, with Price and Soap heading to the boneyard and Ghost heading to the estate with Roach. First up is the estate, in a mission titled Loose Ends. The mission starts off like it's going to be another stealth mission, but that expectation blows up when you stumble across a minefield. Then it's a full-blown intense fight to the estate. When they get there, they breach rooms in an effort to find Makarov. Their elusive target isn't anywhere to be found, but the mission isn't for nothing. The estate is a gold mine for intel, so 141 downloads everything it can while holding off against reinforcements. This defensive segment is intense, and is further intensified by an unreliable download speed, which is a nice touch. The download speed varies from really fast to really slow, so you have no idea how long this defensive segment is actually going to go. It adds a sense of anxiety to the mission. Once the files are downloaded, Ghost and Roach make for an exit. They get there by the skin of their teeth, and all looks to be well as Shepard himself ushers them onto the chopper. Shepard then betrays them. That's one less loose end. No! This is one of the most memorable parts of the games, and it's burned into the player's head. When you ask people what the most memorable part of the game is, if they don't say no Russian, I almost guarantee they'll say this part instead. There are a few reasons why I think it's so memorable. First off, unless you've been paying really close attention and picking apart the dialogue like I did for this video, the betrayal seems to come from completely out of left field. Most players are caught completely by surprise. The next reason is that Shepard is just so disrespectful during this betrayal. He shows no signs of remorse or mourning for killing two of his own men. He kills them in just about the worst way possible too. He could have ended it quickly with bullets in the heads. Instead he burns Roche and Ghost alive, watching with apathy as gasoline is poured over them. Price figured out the betrayal, but too late. You hear his desperate pleading voice as Shepard lords over them. He flicks his cigar onto Roach and Ghost, and he walks away without hesitation as they're engulfed in flames. The sheer cruelty of this betrayal is very effective in a narrative sense. It motivates the player, pushing them through the rest of the game. As the player, you want vengeance for their deaths, and payback for the disrespect. So why did Shepard betray everyone? Well, it's not explicitly laid out, so it's up to a bit of interpretation. I'll get back to it later. Price and McTavish are in the boneyard. A three-way conflict has started between them, Makarov's men, and General Shepard's shadow company. Shepard is hoping to wipe them all out in one fell swoop, thereby burying the truth. His version of history can then be told without anyone knowing the wiser. I figure Shadow Company fired upon Price and McTavish right when Shepard shot Roach, which is how Price determined Shepard wasn't to be trusted. Soap and Price have to weave their way between the enemy factions who are busy fighting each other. Nikolai waits for extraction on the other side of the boneyard. A really interesting moment occurs where Price contacts Makarov himself. He asks Makarov to give him Shepard's location. Price's primary objective is changed. Makarov can come later. Shepard comes first. Price's willingness to team up with Makarov highlights Shepard's attitude during the game's introduction. Yesterday's enemies are today's recruits. The parallels drawn between the two men, and more of these parallels will show up. Price and McTavish's escape reaches an explosive finale, where they have to drive a truck onto a plane, which is blistering across the runway. While Price and McTavish gear up to get Shepard, they reckon with the sheer scale of the force opposing them. 
I love Price's dialogue. It's epic and it really gets you into the mindset to take on Shepard. However, it also highlights another parallel between Shepard and Price. Price remarks about being remembered for their actions. They will remember us for this because out of all our vast array of nightmares, this is the one we choose for ourselves. We go forward like a breath exhaled from the earth with vigor in our hearts and one goal in sight. We will kill him. This reflects Shepard's own desire to be remembered as something grand, as something great. They sneak to Makarov's location. His intel was solid. Shepard appears to be camped out here. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, this is another mission that I loved. Price and McTavish infiltrate the Shadow Company HQ, prey turned predators. When their enemies catch wind, it's a fierce fight, taking down elite soldiers with laser-mounted rifles and others equipped with riot shields. They reach the command center of the HQ, only to discover that it's rigged to blow. Shepard once again demonstrates his sheer disregard for his men's lives, with a single throwaway line to their service being honored. I'm executing Directive 116 Bravo. If you're still inside, your service will be honored. Shepard out. The remnants of 141 narrowly escape, and they continue chasing Shepard. The final mission endgame begins. This is for the record. History is written by the victor. History is filled with liars. If he lives and we die, his truth becomes written and ours is lost. Shepard will be a hero, because all you need to change the world is one good lie and a river of blood. He's about to complete the greatest trick a liar ever played on history. His truth will be the truth, but only if he lives and we die. During the introduction cutscene, Price highlights the stakes of the mission. This is the most striking parallel between Price and Shepard. Price doesn't deny Shepard's assessment of history. In fact, he wholeheartedly agrees with it. History is written by the victors through and through. These parallels illustrate that Price and Shepard actually have a very similar outlook on the world. However, the two men remain diametrically opposed. Why is that? Well, it all comes down to motives. Shepard acts entirely out of self-interest. He fans the flames of war for his own legacy. Price engages in behavior that at times can be just as morally bleak, but his interests are always in the service of others. He launched the nuke, not for his own sake, but to slow down the war. He teamed up with Makarov even, not for his own sake, but to stop Shepard. The similarities and differences here between hero and villain are what make their dynamics so interesting. Soap and Price engage in one final chase of their quarry. This is suitably climactic, with the high intensity and thrills you'd expect. They plunge into a waterfall, leaving McTavish disoriented. He stumbles across the shoreline and finds Shepard. The general gets the better of him, and he stabs McTavish in the chest. Shepard stands over him and prepares to kill him. At this point, he reflects. Five years ago, I lost 30,000 men in the blink of an eye and the world just fucking watched. Tomorrow, there will be no shortage of volunteers, no shortage of patriots. This sheds more light into why Shepard betrayed one for one. It's a cover up that much is clear. Shepard wants to rewrite history and he wants to be seen as a hero, a legend even. But what's it a cover up for exactly? It could merely be to cover up his assignment of Alan to Makarov. The whole terrorist incident that kicked off the war being directly tied to Shepard would definitely be a boo-boo that he would want covered up. It kind of ruins his whole image after all. But there's another theory out there, and it's that Shepard actually leaked Alan's true identity to Makarov on purpose. I think this theory tracks, especially given this cutscene. Shepard wanted this war to happen. He's angry that the US didn't retaliate after the nuclear bomb from the first game. There is no revenge and no retaliation for the casualties. Secondly, Shepard waited to betray 141 until he had his hands on Makarov's information. Why would he do that? Since Alan was a part of 141, it's pretty likely that 141 already knew that Shepard had a hand in planting him. What difference would Makarov's intel make? Well, the evidence could point to Shepard leaking the information. It's not confirmed, not from what I've seen anyway, 
but it's the explanation that makes the most sense to me. As I mentioned earlier, his motives are up to interpretation. Whether or not you like that or find it frustrating, I could see either way. I mean, I found that theory thanks to Reddit. I didn't come to it all by myself. In the nick of time, Price comes to the rescue. Shepard and Price brawl with Price on the losing end. McTavish takes matters into his own hands, pulling a knife out of his own chest and hurling it at Shepard. He's accomplished the mission, but at what cost? Price looks dead in front of him. Then Price stirs. He comes to Soap's aid and with Nikolai's help, Soap is airlifted from the battle. This is reflective of Modern Warfare's ending, where Soap was similarly injured and airlifted from the bridge. With that, Modern Warfare 2 ends on uncertain terms. The war doesn't appear to have ended, and Makarov is still out there somewhere. So let's bring all this together. I think that Modern Warfare 2 is a masterpiece. Its talent especially lies in drawing visceral emotions out of the player. The player swings from triumphant to hopeless, from horrified to enraged, from trusting to betrayed rapidly. It makes the game a ride to play in the purest form of the term, with players bounding from emotional peak to valley to peak again. These emotions too are all cranked up to 10. It's the worst betrayal you can imagine. It's the worst horrors you can imagine. The excitement is at its maximum, with crazy set pieces like snowmobile shootouts and airlifting out of an explosive gulag. Modern Warfare 2 rides the edge of intensity. For some people, it pushes too hard and starts to veer on the edge of absurdity, jumping the shark in other words. For me though, it rides that line perfectly. Pretty much everything the game does works for me, which is why it's one of my favorite campaigns of all time, bumping shoulders for the top spot. However, it's not a game in isolation. Modern Warfare 2 is the second game in a trilogy. Clearly, there's still story left with Makarov running loose and the war still ongoing. Modern Warfare 2 upped the stakes from Modern Warfare. The third entry in a trilogy, being the conclusion, is supposed to up the stakes even higher. Here, I think, is where the complications arise. Modern Warfare 2 cranked the set pieces as high as they could go without diving into the absurd, but trying to crank that notch any further will tip over the edge. Modern Warfare 2 mined that visceral emotion out of the player, and there's tonally little place Modern Warfare can reach that its predecessor didn't. How can any betrayal cut as deeply as Shepard's or be as shocking? How can any event reach the same horrors no Russian? How can any set piece beat blowing up a nuke in orbit? I could go on. Modern Warfare 2 created a very difficult path for Modern Warfare 3 to walk. How can a game increase scale without feeling overly contrived or absurd? All that remains now, I suppose, is to see whether Modern Warfare 3 managed to achieve this monumental feat. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, please consider liking, subscribing, and checking out my Northfield series. Until next time.